Tonight on the Mike Tomlin Show, the Steelers don't have time to enjoy that win over the Rams. It's a short week with a game in Cleveland for Thursday night football. Coach Tomlin breaks down both of those games for Bob Pompiani. The Steelers also celebrate the 40th anniversary of Super Bowl XIV. All of that and much more as the Mike Tomlin Show starts right now. Here we go. This pass is caught and that's a touchdown. That's the way to work. Come on. He's hit that sack. The Steelers win the football game. Let's go. Come get it. You know what it is. This one is in the history books. Here we go. The Mike Tomlin Show is presented by 84 Lumber. Hey everyone, Bob Pompiani along with head coach Mike Tomlin. And coach, I remember last week you said something like, I can't believe we're 4-4 four and four and I'm happy with that, something of that nature. Now you're 5-4 and four after starting 0-3-1-4. and, three and, one and four. How do you feel about your team right now? You know, I like the trajectory of our group. Um, I think we're starting to gain a personality, or at least we're starting to, to gain some grit. You know, uh, we're starting to smile in the face of adversity, and regardless of circumstance, we do, us, do what's required to produce victory kind of at a steady rate week in and week out, and obviously that's what we have strived to do. This defense is making people think about some of the defenses the Steelers have had here many years ago. Uh, that's how good they've been, and we've talked a lot about Minka and TJ, which still uh, two big players, but what about Joe Hayden? He seems to be sort of the calming influence back there, and he made so many unbelievable plays last week. Joe's played consistent and really at a high level, uh, but you could say the same thing about Steven Nelson. I just think how solid or how high our floor has been from a corner standpoint. Forget the plays they make, but the plays that we're not talking about, you know, big plays, broken plays, and things of that nature. Um, they're just two really low-maintenance, solid veteran guys that, that got a high level of consistency, and every now and then, boy, you get a lot of splash like we got from Joe Hayden, uh, which we needed the other night. Cooper Cup came into this game as one of the best third down guys in the game. And at the end of it, he had no catches. Was that probably the biggest thing you take away from how your defense played? Without question. Um, you know, we weren't bashful about trying to minimize uh, his touches in the game, and particularly in situational football. We wanted to start there. We wanted to minimize his impact on the game in those moments and make him go elsewhere and see how it unfolded from there. Uh, we, were, we were effective at doing so, and they probably were uh, less effective at transitioning and going to other places, and that's why we had the amount of success we had, particularly on third down. You've gotten some great push even without Stephon to it. Another guy who stepped up big was Javon Hargrave. Haven't talked a lot about him, but you know he's playing with some incentive as well, isn't he? Man, he, he plays with an edge, man. He's a guy that's a nose guard in a contract year, and you know in today's game, uh, you can't just be a nose. There's not a lot of opportunities for noses. There's so much sub package football. And man, he, this is the second year in a row where he showed us that he's more than just a nose. You know, unfortunately, Tua has gone down two years in a row with some injuries. But for the second year in a row, he's given us quality sub package interior rush uh, capabilities, man. And that's an asset to him and to us. Looking at the Rams last year when they had their Super Bowl season, I mean, they scored like 30 a game almost every game. They were putting up record numbers. The fact that they came in here were one for 14 on third down, over two on fourth down. You guys continued to turn the ball over to the tune of 26. I mean, as a head coach, I know that was a big issue in the offseason. How proud of you are these guys for doing what they're doing at such a record rate? You know, I'm not taking a lot of time to judge it at this point. Um, I'm appreciative in those moments because it's critical in terms of us winning games. But, man, we're building and hopefully building in the right ways. And, you know, we got some significant battles that lie ahead. Um, us, whether it's us collectively as a team or us as a unit, man, you'll be defined as how you play down these stretches, man, as you get into the holiday season. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's proof in the pudding in those, in those moments. So I'm excited about watching that hopefully continue. The offense still has its issues. Let's start with the run game. Only 1.8 yards per carry. I know that is below what your line is. James Conner, will he be able to play? And if so, what – impact will he have? Man, we, we're excited about him uh, being available to us. Um, you know, James is a frontline starter in this league and a guy that's been to the Pro Bowl, so he needs no endorsement from me in terms of his impact. But you also couple that with the lack of availability of Rosie Nix, and uh, it's created some issues in our run, and there's no, no two ways about it. We've worked hard to be creative uh, in terms of supplementing it. 
uh, with, whether it's Wildcat or whether it's quick rhythm passing uh, that supplements for run game alternative. We've done things week in and week out to try to level the playing field. Long handoffs, if you will. Remember one week we were flipping the ball at jet people as they went by. So we're working our tails off to control the game and to, and to possess the ball. High frequency passes, long handoffs, if you will, that keep us on schedule with minimal risks that puts us behind the chains. But that can only go so far for so long. The reality is, is we got to get back to an established, consistent run. And hopefully the, the presence of James and the likes of Rosie Nix are, are key components of that. Even without that, I thought some of the best girls, and you make a thousand decisions a game, fourth and one. Uh, you decided to go for it, and that showed a lot of confidence in both your offense, but also I think your defense as well. What went into that? Decision? You know, man, we ask our guys to play hard and to play without fear, um, and, and so we have to coach that way, and we have to show them that we're supporting them in that way. I think they feed off of it, regardless of the outcome of these plays, man, they have to know that we're willing to take the calculated risks associated with pursuit of victory. You know, we also, you know, called a play pass on possession and 10 backed up and it turned into a safety. So it's always funny to me, um, those decisions are judged based on the outcome of the game. You know, we lose that game, man, that's probably a, a dumb move, <laughs> but we didn't. And so that's why there is no fear. Right. We can't worry about the consequences of negativity at times. Uh, we got we to gotta boldly pursue victory and that's something that that I pride myself in. And they are going to pursue win number five in a row, but it won't be easy going to Cleveland. Uh, that's coming up tomorrow night. We're going to talk to Coach Tomlin about the problems that they possess. They're coming off a win and one that was a big one for them in terms of momentum. That's when we return. Missy, let's go back to you. And the Browns are coming off a big home win as well, Bob, and hoping to gain their own momentum. Get ready for three straight weeks of AFC North football for the Steelers beginning tomorrow night at First Energy Stadium. We'll go back to Coach and Bob right after this break to learn more about the challenges the Cleveland Browns present. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Mike Tomlin Show. The Steelers have won four games in a row, while the Browns have just snapped a four-game losing streak. Either way, records out the window. It's a primetime game in Cleveland tomorrow night. Coach Tomlin is standing by with Bob Pompieni to talk about the 3-6 and six Cleveland Browns. Hey, Missy, it's a big one. It's Cleveland-Pittsburgh. Actually, two in three weeks coming up. And, Coach, you have them on a Thursday night in Cleveland, and you know that place is going to be rocking. They're coming off a win, and their record says 3-8 and eight, or 3-6, and six, but quite frankly, they have a, a, a lot of talent on that football team. Where do you start to break it down? With the ridiculous talent that they have on offense, you know, um, you know their record isn't indicative of what they're capable of. I think their performance versus Baltimore is more indicative of what they're capable of in reference to us. Uh, we in the North understand the critical elements of these matchups, how important divisional play is, and how deep the waters run in terms of some of these rivalries. So we anticipate getting the best of these guys, and the best of these guys is pretty daunting. You know, on offense, um, Nick Chubb has been spectacular. He's just under 1,000 yards on the season. Now couple that with the presence of Hunt. Um, they've got a ridiculous one-two combination in the backfield. And then obviously the LSU boys at, at wide receiver, uh, Beckham and Landry, um, are, are ridiculous talent. Probably none better from a talent standpoint. In the National Football League, you got first pick in the draft and, and Baker Mayfield under center uh, orchestrating it all. So we got our hands full uh, working to minimize what their offense is capable of, particularly in that setting at their place on a Thursday night. What do you try to take away first, given all that talent? You know, I think it's really situationally. Um, at times, man, uh, Chubb is a featured component of what they do, and in other moments, that receiver group is. And so we better, we better pick, our, pick our poison wisely um, and let situations kind of be our guide. Uh, one thing you can't do is, is minimize all of them all the time. And so there's some decisions that need to be made, and a balancing act, if you will, and I think our level of success is going to depend on, one, our ability to, to, to prudently choose the fights, but also um, just prudently choosing the fights doesn't necessarily dictate victory. 
I mean, you can gear up to stop Nick Chubb, and I'm sure some of some of the people that have played against him have, and he's still going to do what what he's done. I'm sure Baltimore knew what he was yeah. capable of going into that game, and he went to Baltimore and really ran through those guys. So, um, you know, stating it, acknowledging it is just the element of it. Man, we got to perform. It's always difficult to game plan given a whole week. You only have a few days. Does that make it advantageous? Not as uh, advantageous. You know the team. It's a different cast of characters. But what goes into that on a short week? You know, I think that's one of the things that the that the NFL has kind of done with the 30, Thursday night games. Oftentimes, they're divisional games and second time around vig, mm-hmm. vig, divisional games and things of that nature. Things that kind of bridge the gap from a lack of preparedness, if you will, because of time. So, you know, we are working on the short week, but it is the Browns. We are familiar with them. They're familiar with us. I imagine by the time we step into that stadium uh, that that element of it will be insignificant. Um, They're familiar with our personnel strengths and weaknesses. We're familiar with their personnel strengths and weaknesses. Uh, It's going to come down to the play um, and the game planning and our ability to put guys uh, in position to perform, particularly situationally. Last week you had to deal with Aaron Donald. You had to deal with Clay Matthews and Dante Fowler this week. Uh, Miles Garrett jumps to the start. Um, talk about Mason Rudolph, his awareness, especially with that guy on the field, given the rate at which he's sacking. You know, um, Mason can't be, a, can't be concerned about his location, particularly because like Aaron Donald, they move him around so much. He's got to have his eyes downfield in an effort to get rid of the ball in a timely manner. He's got to depend on the guys up front. Uh, we got a lot of trust in the guys up front um, to, to give them an appropriate time. But oftentimes, rushing coverage works together. And they got some quality guys on the back end. I mean, they got a high pedigree cornerback tandem uh, in Ward and Greedy Williams. And, and so, you know, like, like I just mentioned earlier, you can talk about getting the ball out on rhythm and beating that rush and, and, and hitting your back foot and throwing. But oftentimes, you got the type of quality coverage people that they have top round draft picks uh, that's not an easy task so we got to stand up to the likes of Miles Garrett and and company and I say in company because they've added to that group man uh, Olivier Vernon man if available mm-hmm. man is a tremendous edge rusher opposite of Miles and uh, Sheldon Richardson is a top five type talent um, out of Missouri that's been in the league a number of years now that they also acquired so man we got our hands full but uh, you know such is life we'll be excited man we're always excited for AFC North Divisional play. Especially on a Thursday night on national TV. When we come back, Coach Holland will talk about a special honor that one of his players has received. That's when we return. Missy, let's go back to you. That's right, Bob. We'll have much more on the George Hallis Award that Ryan Shazier received on Sunday at Heinz Field. Coming up next, the Steelers got the win and helped celebrate the 40th anniversary of Super Bowl XIV. We have all the highlights coming your way from Alumni Weekend. The Mike Tomlin Show is presented by 84 Lumber. Are you 84 material? Visit 84lumber.com slash careers to learn more. Well, you could call it a family reunion of sorts. Members of the Steelers Super Bowl XIV team gathered in Pittsburgh this past weekend for a very special anniversary. That championship, of course, marked the fourth in six years for the Steelers, setting a standard for years to come. This past weekend, the Steelers celebrated their 40th anniversary of Super Bowl XIV. We never get tired of uh, celebrating Super Bowl wins around here, that's for sure. And uh, this team really was a uh, historic team. The weekend began with a gathering at the Omni William Penn, where former players had a chance to relive their championship glory in a series of interviews with Stan Saverin. I, I, I can't think of a day go by that it's not something that I've learned or heard from Chuck that I don't use in my everyday life. Afterwards, the team gathered for a special dinner at Heinz Field where memories were shared. On Sunday, the team descended upon Heinz Field for a reunion for one of the greatest teams of all time. Hall of Famers Lynn Swan and John Stallworth led the terrible towel twirl. Wave those terrible towels! And the team was recognized in a special ceremony at halftime. 
Hall of Famer Joe Green, who you saw was in town this past weekend, recently wrote the foreword to a book about the late Dan Rooney. It was started by one of Rooney's sons, a project that soon became a labor of love. Bob Pompieni is with Jim Rooney now to talk about a different way to win. Bob? Okay, Missy, thanks very much. Those of you out there looking for the perfect gift at Christmas time, we have a great one for you. It's a new book that is authored by Mr. Jim Rooney, uh, son of Dan Rooney, and it's called A Different Way to Win. And Jim, I know you put a lot of hours into this book. Um, first of all, tell me about why you decided to do it, and overall, what kind of book is this? Yep. Thanks, Bob, and it's good to be with you. Uh, so we, we try to tell a story about, uh, you know, my father's approach to sort of his professional life business. You know, and we, we try to show that you can have civility, that you can treat people well, that you don't have to be consumed by greed, but you still can be very successful. And I think that that's what he did. So that was sort of the, the basic of the story. We, we took four main uh, perspectives of his life or four main activities of his life. Obviously the Steelers of the 1970s and before that we weren't very good and what, what he did to sort of help this organization become what it became. Uh, his work as an influencer in the National Football League um, and, and how they went from really a sandlot thing when he first started to, to you know, a powerhouse in the, in the entertainment industry, his time in Ireland and the contribution of the peace process, and then finally the Rooney role and his contribution that, that now is, is used globally in all different types of industry to diversity in the hiring practices. Yeah, you, I think that's the best thing to say about a man like Dan Rooney is the fact that he touched not just football people, I think because you're an owner of a football team, people think you're just doing that. I want to get back to what you said about Northern Ireland. And that was so important to him, I know. He eventually became ambassador. But what, when he first got involved there, uh, what did you see from your father that made you know, man, this, this is somebody special who's willing to bring people together? Well, you know, I guess one of the, the sort of funny stories, um, you, you sort of knew my dad and his, his, his health gutsy he was with his flying and those types of things. So one day we're right on the border and he knew as an American citizen that, that things weren't going to be, you know, you, you know, he always had a little bit of a, a special card to play. So they stop us at the border and he was driving a little too fast, which he always did. And they put the guns right inside the car and my mother and everyone were scared to death. And he starts laughing. And as soon as he started speaking with an American accent, the British are not going to you know, we're not going to take on the, the, an American, but, but you understood that this was something different than, you know, just a, a sort of dispute amongst communities. And, and, and you had that sense of, of you know, the ever-present violence, the ever-present military presence, um, and his willingness to commit to getting involved in the process, but also doing it a certain way, where there were a lot of people who were funding things that would continue the violence. And it was a lot harder to say, wait a minute, there's a third way here. There's a way that, that we can have dialogue, that we can try to bring type, some type of reconciliation amongst people. Um, and, and he was always working to bring different groups of people together. And he went into Derry, he went into Newry, he went into Belfast. And these towns, you know, they looked like movie scenes from World War II. I mean, there were buildings collapsed on the, on the, on the ground, just piles of rocks, um, things that, that are somewhat hard for us to imagine. But, you know, he went there and he went there every year for 20 years and, and really um, committed to trying to make a difference there. That's what I remember most of him because he talked about Ireland so just unbelievably and what his role there. You talk about the Rooney Rule, all these things, bringing people together for the betterment of humanity. I think that's the biggest thing you say about Dan Rooney. And I know you interviewed a lot of people. There's some great reading out there, ladies and gentlemen. So do yourself a favor if you have a Steeler fan. A Different Way to Win goes on sale tomorrow. All Steeler fans should have it. Uh, the great Dan Rooney remembered by his son, Jim. Thanks, Jim, for the time. We appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. All right, Missy, back to you. There's more to come tonight on the Mike Tomlin Show. Up next, Coach Tomlin tells us how Ryan Shazier is still very much a part of the Steelers team. Please join us in congratulating linebacker Ryan Shazier as the 2019 George Hallis Award winner, as selected by the Professional Football Writers of America.
the award is given to an NFL player, coach, or staff member who overcomes the most adversity to succeed. Let's hear it one more time for Pittsburgh Steelers linebacker and 2019 Hallis Award winner, Ryan Shazier. Ryan Shazier joins Rocky Blyer and John Stallworth as the Steelers' three recipients of the George Hallis Award. Let's head back over now to Bob Pompieni, who's with Coach Tallman, to talk more about Shazier and how he is continuing to inspire others. Hey, Missy, it was a big week, not just because the Steelers won, made it four in a row, but also a big honor for Ryan Shazier, who continues to inspire people, not just here, but all over the place. When you hear a coach of a George Hallis Award, I don't think you need to say much more than that. And the fact that Ryan received that award is pretty amazing. No question. Uh, what an honor, but an honor that's well-deserved. Man, Ryan's just such a quality guy. I forget the type of player he is and, you know, the adversity he's faced. It's just been cool to that he's allowed us to have a ringside seat to, to watch not only his approach to attack and rehab, but, man, just his approach to life. Um, you see him a lot with a backpack these days, man. He's a full-time <laughs> student, also at Pitt, uh, finishing his undergraduate degree. So there's just a lot for him to be proud of, a lot that's inspirational about how he's conducting himself as a young man. How much does he still impact your team? Every day. Um, you know, he's around us every day. He's on the field. He's in classroom settings helping young guys like Devin Bush grow and mature. Um, guys get an opportunity to work alongside him in the weight room and see the vigor in which he attacks his rehabilitation. Uh, he's just an inspirational guy all, all the way around. Um, he's always been a team guy. He's always been very communicative. And so that hasn't changed uh, even though his availability has, and we're thankful for that. And his attitude is spectacular. If you ever want to uh, find yourself in a situation where you can look to someone who's used an attitude to get through some adversity, he's no probably the number one man to do it. No question. That's going to do it for our show this week. Mike, all the best to you. Thank you. Thank Tomorrow you. night, it's the Browns and the Steelers. We'll be back in a couple of Saturdays as we get you set for the Bengals, which would be next up after that, a lot of AFC North football. That's going to do it for our program tonight. For Missy Matthews and head coach Mike Tomlin, I'm Bob Pompiani. Have a good one. We'll see you next week, everyone.